When you kind oh, yeah. of when you set up a massive road system, you kind of become dependent on the car on the vehicle that's right. going to use it, and and that's kind of sad. You know, you block creativity there. I suspect by now we'd be zipping around in hovercrafts and yeah. parking them on our roofs. There's no if question. It for, that they, they've, yeah, they've if it been weren't for the testing. fact that we have this massive road system that we have to maintain. Right. Uh, it's the same thing. Um, you know, somebody once said, well, who would build roads in a libertarian um, system? And, you know, those people who need them would build them. The colonial people built roads, and they didn't have a central government saying, oh, we've got to put Route 280 here and Route 80 here, and we've got to do this, and my brother-in-law is going to build it for, you know, a, a lot of money. Um, you didn't see that sort of stuff then. and But we've never really had a free market in this country. Every time something goes wrong, the government blames it on the free market that doesn't exist. We've been a socialist system for a very long time, and it hasn't done us very good, much good at all. And Kate, a um, question from a yeah. person I just got a message from. She says, he says, uh, ask her what she thinks about what society would be like if there was no scarcity, that we... That we have had flat scarcity imposed to control economics. Yeah, abs- I, I think it, we'd be post-scarcity by now. In that case, you'd see a situation where people would probably share the wealth. I think we were, we were getting closer and closer to post-scarcity, but scarcity is something that's controlled by government. It's kind of like Murray Rothbard, dear Murray Rothbard, the father of modern libertarianism, um, thrown out of Ayn Rand's inner circle because he wouldn't divorce his Presbyterian wife, uh, uh, Joanne, and a uh, dear man, very funny man, um, miss him terribly. And he, uh, you know, used to talk about the, how the government screws up the marketplace, okay? Totally screws up the marketplace. There's no more need for buggy whips, but we can't let the buggy whip people not have a job anymore um, so we have to send tax money to the bubby, buggy whip uh, companies so they can continue producing something we have no need for just because we've got to keep those people uh, in in a job. And this isn't true. You know, the economy has to move where it has to move. And when you don't need buggy whips anymore, you have to move on to something else. You say, well, you know, I have a talent with leather. Maybe I ought to make purses. Maybe I'll, I'll go to work for Gucci or something like that. Um, you have to move on. That's, that's what it's all about. That's going forward. And the government prevents that by sticking us in certain places. They've destroyed the school system. I mean, teachers can't teach anymore. They are limited as to what they can say in a classroom. I've spoken to so many teachers who say, you know, the truth of this history is this, and I'm not allowed to say that in the classroom. And kids are being badly, badly educated. This is why the homeschool kids are are going way past the public school kids every day because their parents are teaching them more. Uh, I, I think if government got out of the way, this country would be much further ahead than it is. In fact, Ralph did a study on that back when he was in college because he did a lot of history in college uh, before he became a, um, a libertarian lawyer. And uh, one of the things he studied was the educational system. And during the Industrial Revolution, they, the big industrialists, the big money people in this country, uh, Morgan, um, all those people said, geez, we, we can't, we'd love to build factories, but we can't get Americans to work in them. Over in Bismarck's Germany, people will stand on their feet 16 hours a day at a very low wage doing the same thing over and over and over, and they're perfectly happy. And over here, we can't hire people to do that. Well, a lot of the people who were very ambitious came to America for the freedom, and they weren't going to stand in one space all day. They took two and three jobs a day so that they could afford to bring over friends and relatives so they could build their own little restaurants and shops um, and, and produce things. They were ambitious. And there was no way they were going to work in that factory like that. 
So they realized that they had to somehow change the American psyche. They sent a group of people called the educationalists. They consisted of um, Dewey of the Dewey Decimal System, Harriet Beecher Stowe, and there were several others. And they were sent over for a year or two to Bismarck's Germany to study the system over there to see how do they get these people to work the way they do. Well, they came back and they said it's in one word, kindergarten. These kids are taught to stand in line. They're taught to raise their hand, wanting or twoing it. They're taught to be very obedient. They're taught not to be creative, and they're taught to think what they're told to think. And we kept the name kindergarten over here, and we formed the public school system. And, of course, as with every government program, they espoused it. They, they lauded it as the most wonderful thing, this is going to help everybody. This is going to educate everybody. And the fact is, it took education down. Before the public school system, people got educated. They got educated according to how they needed to be educated. Churches ran free schools. Neighborhoods got together and hired teachers. You saw, if you see any um, shows on the Old West, um, a town would hire a school marm to come in, and they'd share things, but it wasn't set up the way the public education system is today where everything is uh, by rote, everything is controlled, everything is consistent, and now we have Michelle Obama telling the kids what they can and can't eat. Um, it was it was a freer system. It was, if the teacher had information on George Washington, um, they learned it, even if it was not necessarily nice. Um, cause, and I think of that because I was talking to someone last night about the alleged whiskey rebellion, which took place after the revolution when George Washington went after the those making whiskey to tax them. Here was a man who had just fought a revolution against taxes, and now he was taxing people. But the interesting thing is our school system has handed that bit of history down, not as the whiskey tax rebellion, but as the whiskey rebellion. Now, who rebels his right. whiskey, right? But this is the way they word things. This is the way things are, are set up. There's, there's so much hypocrisy and so much nonsense. Last week, one of the um, comedians on The Daily Show, got up and did a number on Ayn Rand. And I heard a tiny bit of it. It was supposed to be hysterical. Now, being a libertarian and being one of the 30 or 40 people who called themselves a libertarian back in the 60s and 70s, um, at a time when we thought you know, the word libertarian wouldn't come into common usage for another 100 years, um, I knew a lot of people, not a lot, but I knew some people, some of my friends were taking classes at the Nathaniel Brandon Institute, which was an Ayn Rand um, uh, school. And so I went to some evening uh, uh, lectures with, with them on occasion. Uh, I did not consider myself an objectivist, a Randian objectivist, because while I did agree with her theories on the marketplace and on economics, she had very strict guidelines as to what a person should think and how they should feel and what they should like and dislike. She hated being referred to as a libertarian, and she constantly denied that. And she wasn't a libertarian. She had a very strict setup for what life should be and what it shouldn't be. Um, but um, listening to all this and, and watching all this, you know, you realize when you read Atlas Shrugged, you realize she was right about a lot of things. She was right about the marketplace. And people that say, oh, we have this corporate capitalism now and it's terrible. Well, Rand said the same thing. Yet you'll have these socialists who are criticizing this corporate capitalism that's going on where the government and the big corporations are acting as one. You have, you have them criticizing they're also criticizing her when, in fact, if you read Atlas Shrugged, the companies that remained independent until they got totally disgusted and went underground, just, to, you know, they, they, their owners abandoned them, um, they were the good guys and they were the ones that were providing jobs and doing good work. And then there was the crony corporate capitalists who were working with government, and they were the ones who ultimately tore down and pulled down society. 
And people, you know, will criticize her when actually if they read her book, which most people don't, they'd realize she agreed with them. You know, she agreed with them that this crony capitalism is not good. And so I get a little annoyed because this this comedian got up last week and did a number on the selfishness of Ayn Rand. She espoused selfishness. She was quite blunt. She said that people operate in their own self-interest, and for the most part, they do. You know, you look for the best job. You, you try and find the best you can for your money. You're operating in your own self-interest. Granted, you help other people, too. You reach out. And you, I mean, you know, you, if somebody needs help, a friend needs help, you help them as you can. But generally speaking, people have to operate in their own self-interest or they, they die. Mm-hmm. And what really irked me when I heard about this criticism of Rand was this comedian probably makes millions a year. He does all kinds of shows. Right. He does, and, and, and how much of his money is he giving away? He is operating selfishly in his own self-interest, and at the same time, he, he is living what Ayn Rand talked about, and he's making fun of her. Mm-hmm. Now, there are things about Rand I didn't like, you know. There, so like, hey, that. she was who she was. I'm who I am. I don't care. Live and let live. But these people these days, right now, there's a great deal of backlash against her because the movie Atlas Shrugged has come out in three parts. Um, I don't think they did a very good job with it because if you are an objectivist and you've read her books, you know where they're going. But if you're not an objectivist, you don't really get it. You know, you're not really learning about free markets by watching it. Uh, my son took economics courses at the county college um, years ago. And he came home with this book that was almost three inches thick. And there must have been 500 definitions in in it from economics. And I skimmed through this book, went through the pages, looked at it, and I turned to him and I said, yeah, you have to memorize this crap in order to take your tests. But I'm going to tell you right now, there are only two words, two words, Two definitions that you really need to know if you're in business. Two things that you have to consider. They are supply and demand. That's it. Yep. That's it. And if you get them right, you'll have a successful business. And if you don't get them right, you won't. All the rest is crap. And this is what Rand was basically saying, and this is what libertarians are basically saying. And no, libertarians don't hate people, and they're not anti-charity. They just believe charity should be done individually by themselves, because if you give the government $100 for charity, they're going to keep 90 of it, and the, the people who need the money are only going to get 10. Um, we're living in very strange times. I'm not sure what direction they're going to go in. We're like at the edge of a cliff, and we could either pull back and go toward freedom, which would make things so much better for people, or we could go forward, fall over that cliff, and really see a mess with civilization. I do believe that because we live in this hologram and we're creating it with our thoughts and we've bought into a lot of the things we've read and seen, I do believe that we're going to see some cataclysms. I worry for the East Coast, and I worry for the West Coast. Uh, After what I saw last night about symbolism, um, particularly uh, symbolic shapes of certain land masses, uh, I'm convinced that the West Coast is going to go, and um, I wouldn't want to be living out there. Uh, On the other hand, I do believe that life is forever, and that we come and go, And we learn different things in each life. It's just a shame we can't take it with us because if you do a lot of studying, you know, you hate to leave and then have to come back and start all over again. (laughs) That's a lot of work. Mm -hmm. But um, on the other hand, people do need to wake up and a lot of them need to study more. Um, I do think that the Anunnaki are affecting us and have been affecting us. I do think there are other... Alien groups that have been affecting us. Um, as you know, Jeff, I don't know that I should go into this. No, you can. You can go. You can please. There's no limit. Okay. As you know, I have. I've had alien um, experiences, 
And um, Ralph was always very upset by the idea and, you know, kind of like took it like, oh, sure, uh uh-huh, uh-huh, that really happened to you. And then in, finally, in 1994. Ralph is your husband, correct? My husband, yes. And uh, in 1994, um, it was Thanksgiving week. And it was th- it was the night after Thanksgiving. It was Friday night, and it was eleven something p.m. And my husband and my son, who at that time was only about six years old, were sitting in the family room in this townhouse we had in Morristown. And I was washing dishes, and I and they were too tired to walk upstairs and go to bed, you know. And I uh, was washing dishes when I got the message that I should go out front and say hello. And I said, I'm washing dishes. And uh, no, no, come out now. So I went out to the front step, um, the the front, and opened the door. And I knew something was about to happen because there was no sound, no sound at all. Um, uh, No bugs, no people, no cars, nothing was going on. And here I am in the middle of a mini city in the middle of north central Jersey. And There's no sound at all, so I knew something was about to happen. And all of a sudden, the apartment building across the street from me, uh, I noticed um, three massive white lights in the shape of an isosceles triangle coming toward me very slowly and very quietly. And it went right over my head, and underneath I saw it was a massive triangle. And it very clean. looked like it had just been through a car wash. And uh, when this happens... You are physically capable of talking, but you don't want to. And that's been true with me with different types of ships and different experiences. You just suddenly don't want And so I um, looked at this thing, and when it went over the roof, over my head, and out of my sight, my ability to speak came back, and I opened up the door and screamed in, Ralph, open up the rear door and look up now. He was two feet from it, so he jumped up, opened up the door, looked up, and saw this massive thing 20 feet above our roof. And he watched it float slowly down Elm Street, down the side street, and uh, watched it then take off. And um, for months afterwards, he would come in and say, draw that again. I I can't believe I saw it, but I know I saw it. (laughs) It really bothered him for a long time. But since we moved up here, up to Sussex, he's seen a lot more. Oh, wow. And um, and he's much more open um, to the fact that there are beings from other planets and how involved they are in this whole uh, control scheme. Are they a creation of it? that we're witnessing and seeing is somehow separate from another planet? Are they a creation of these controllers? Or are they um, actually from other planets and they're here to help us escape that? It's really hard to tell. You know, when Um, I was living there in 2001, you did something similar. You screamed out loud, uh, you know, Ralph, Drew, Jeff, come outside. And I was the only one who responded. I go outside and to the front porch, I look back. I, I kind of knew it was coming. And, uh, yeah, it, it, I mean, it was at least 150 wide feet wide, a uh, black yeah. triangle. It's, it's kind of Yeah, scary. and it's, it's mostly been, with me, it's mostly been cigar-shaped things. And I think that's Pleiadian. Um, a couple of times I was pulled out of the place in Morristown. I was told, get out now, get out now. And I went outside into the little private garden and sat there and then watched um, a black helicopter that didn't even appear to have a, a, a you know, a, a flyer, a person flying it. it. It looked like it was empty, but it would go back and forth across the roof and slowly and then disappear. Now, is why me, okay? Is this bloodline? Is this something generational? Is it something that has maybe been because of past lives? I don't know. And, and, you, see, and you see this, um, you know, fairly regularly? I have to tell you, the last couple of years have been very quiet, but I do know mm-hmm. that there is a war going on out in the heavens over this planet. And so I, well, uh, that I doesn't surprise me. I definitely believe in... I definitely believe there's a spiritual warfare going on. But the and, question, uh, is this real? Or is this something, too? Alien presence, just another religion being created by these right. controllers. So we're seeing what they want us to see, 
because this is a hologram. You can create all kinds of things. They're seeing what they, we're seeing what they want us to see in order to create another belief system. Right. And I look at it and I think, is this real? Is this a belief system or what? Okay. And it's getting to the point. Barbara um, Marciniak uh, channels the Pleiadians. And although I'm told of late that she's channeling other entities that aren't quite so nice, I don't know that for a fact. Um, uh, but uh, she said, I was at a meeting years ago with a, a group of people. It was a, a class she was offering. And she said at that time, there will come a p- time when you will not be able to determine what is real and what isn't. You will be totally confused by the information coming at you. And I think we're there. Because one minute I think, yeah, that's got to be truth. And the next minute I think, uh, 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 back up a little bit, that's probably not truth. Mm-hmm. And so it's, it's and truth, what is truth? I, it, it turns out it's subjective. That's where Ayn Rand was wrong. <laughs> is there an objective reality? I don't think so. Maybe I'm wrong on that too, though. (laughs) But I don't believe there is an objective reality. I believe it's all subjective. And you can play games with yourself to prove that to yourself by creating things. Um, One night after Thanksgiving dinner, um, this was just about four years ago, um, you know how they have these sales now. They used to be the next morning, the morning after Thanksgiving, you'd go to all the stores for sales. Right. And and it started, it was going to be, you know, 6 a.m. the next day and everybody get up early. And then it was 4 a.m. And then now it's midnight or even earlier the night before. So everybody rushes after they've eaten their turkey and they're exhausted um, uh, from all the uh, food they've eaten. They grab their coats and they jump in their cars and they go running out to the stores to shop. I don't know if they will this year. The economy is so bad. But um, they they did then. Four years ago, they were still doing it. And we decided to go up to Harriman, New York, which is off of Route 17, north of New York City. It is a shopping center. There are probably uh, 150 stores there, and they are very expensive stores. They are um, the, the really – where you're getting very expensive clothes on sale. Um, but I don't go to those stores. <laughs> and, you know, I, I buy cheap clothes. Um, but I did want to go to the Williams Sonoma outlet because there were some gifts I wanted to get there, and I thought it would be fun. Let's go out. Well, we got up to a road that was probably five miles from that shopping center, and we left at 8 o'clock. Um, and it was about 9 o'clock, and I think the stores were going to open at about 11. And we got on this road, and all of a sudden we noticed bright lights on the side of the road with signs, flashing signs saying, for the Harriman Mall, get off here and park and take a bus. No more parking in the mall. And my son said, oh, we better get off. And I said, no, 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 I've got a space planned. And he said, you were crazy, Um, which is something he always says to me anyway. But we passed that parking lot. We passed two or three more parking lots before we got to the major intersection by the mall where the cars were just on top of each other. And some were trying to get out of the mall, but most were trying to get in. And my son said, we should go back and park in one of those lots. And I said, no, 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 I've got a space plan. I'm buying a lot of of glassware, and I don't want to have to carry it around. I want to be able to put it in my car. I have to be by William Sonoma. And there, he and his girlfriend are looking at me like I am the nuttiest woman on earth. Mm -hmm. Um, And so we finally, we moving it, you know, five miles an hour, we finally get into the parking lot. And I said, go straight ahead, and you couldn't. They had a barricade, and I said, ah, oh, this means we have to go completely around the shopping center. I said, go to your right. And so we're driving slowly around the shopping center, and, and he kept saying, what are, where do I go, where do I go? And I said, keep going, keep going. And finally, without looking up, I said, make your next left. And he said, it's a short, dead end. I said, make it, take the next left. He took the next left, driving down it, Two cars from the sidewalk, there was an opening, okay? Two cars from the sidewalk, there was an opening. I said, pull in. He is in shock. He pulls in, and I said, now look up. Are we near William Sonoma? Everyone looked up, and there was William Sonoma. 
Now, how did I do that? I got in the right state of mind, and I set it up because all of this is a hologram. None of it's real. And, yeah, there are some things I feel absolutely secure doing, and I have no problems doing them, and I do them well, and other things I'm not so good at manifesting. Um, And a lot has to do with the way you're raised, with what you're taught as you're growing up, or what you're bringing with you from a former life. We should all practice more, and we should all practice for for good things, not just for for well, ourselves and our families, our friends, and for for the world, for Mom Earth. Just, uh, if the, if that's what you believe, then um, just uh, what, what's after? What's after this this life? Um, another. We're still learning. We're still learning, and we're still expanding into the universe. We're still creating. I, I don't I think mostly the purpose of coming here was simply to have fun. And and we don't do that. We get down here and because we've gotten caught up in this drama that's going on, uh we tend to be more into survival than into having fun. Mm-hmm. And and we need to focus more on that, more on good things happening, um, in order to to change that. But I think we come down, we're expanding. The universe is expanding. Ideas are expanding. You think, okay, now we know everything you can possibly know. Bull. There's so much more to know, simply because we're creating it as we go. Right. We're here to, we're here as artists. We're here as artists. We're not discovering things. We're creating them. And and we're here to create, to make it better. And I do believe there will come a point when um, I, I think very shortly we'll see work hours cut back so more people can be hired and people will be working 25- and 30-hour weeks um, and prices will probably go down to match uh, so that, you know, two people will do maybe the work of one person, uh, formerly one person, in order to keep things going. And I don't think that will be by any government order. Because if it is, it won't work. It has to be done through the marketplace. You have to go by supply and demand, supply and demand, and then things work. The moment the government comes in and says, oh, it's got to be done this way, you just see a screw-up. I mean, come on, look at this health plan. What a joke. (laughs) Very rough for people like me who use alternatives and very rarely uses anything mainstream. I'm supposed to pay for mainstream. And and look, in, in Switzerland last week they had a vote. Do you want the government to provide health insurance or do you want to continue purchasing your own? They voted overwhelmingly. It was like 70%. We want to buy our own. And um, they're smart. They're, they're looking around and they're saying we're not going to be like those stupid Americans or those <laughs> you know, stupid Swedes. In, Sw- in um, um, Sweden, people are buying what they call um, secondary health plans because the government plan just isn't working. In Canada, women with breast cancer for decades came down to the United States because that supposedly Mm -hmm. wonderful plan the Canadians have is very backward. They don't have the money to go forward and, and find new things. So women who were comfortably well off, if they got, they came here. They came to America, and they won't anymore under Obamacare. They'll probably say, how old is she? Oh, put her to death. Um, Fortunately, people are waking up again. Um, They're waking up that they have power, and um, and I think we're going to see more and more people healing themselves, either with energies, like Sherry is working to reverse people's problems with. I have to be careful how I say that. Uh, but she is brilliant, and she uses sound brilliantly. And we'll see more of that, and we'll also more, see more people getting control over their manifestations and keeping themselves whole and healthy. Um, and I do think that's coming. There is a wonderful man. Um, the, the name of the book is Manifesting Michelangelo. Um, his name is J.P. Farrell. And he is um, a very wonderful man, um, a dear man, wonderful energy around this guy, just a cloud of beautiful energy around him. And he, um, his dad was the Marlboro man in those old cigarette ads. And he lived out on Long Island, a comfortable middle, upper middle class life. And he worked on Wall Street for a while, but he didn't feel fulfilled. And he wanted to do something. Yeah. We've we've had uh, Joseph Farrell on the show, I think, once or twice. Did you get him on the show? Yeah. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Oh, that's wonderful. 
wonderful. I didn't know that. Um, we're working with him out in Princeton. He is setting up a, a center out there. And wait, are you talking about Joseph Farrell, the scientist or the healer? The author. Of that jo- book? Wait a minute. Jo- there are Joseph two Joseph P- Farrells, and they both write books. Joseph P. Farrell. Yeah, there are two of them, and they both write books. Was this the guy who's setting up a healing center in he, Princeton? He's, he's a doctor. So, yeah, that that's, that's the one. No. Okay, okay. The guy that's setting up the healing center in Princeton is an artist. Okay. The other one is a scientist and is into string theory and all kinds of unusual stuff. Great, okay. great writer, wonderful writer. Um, he's he's questioned things and brought them to the forefront. A um, lot of YouTubes on him, and uh, but this one there's one tiny YouTube on. But this guy is opening up a center in Princeton. It's being worked on right now, and um, it's going to be a healing school where people come and they learn. It's it, it's very different from hands-on healing, but they learn how to use energies to heal people. And his track record is phenomenal. Hmm. Um, I, I mean, he literally, there was one case, they're going to be doing a series of, on this guy on Channel 13. There was one case where um, a young man who was born with a very mutilated face came to him, and this person is pictured in the book, and he had had something like 20 or 25 operations, and he was only in his early 20s. And he still looked so bad that he wouldn't go out. And this man worked on him just a few times, bringing his face so so much closer to normal that he started going out and feeling good about himself. And he is looking quite good now. Still has a little ways to go, but he's almost there. And a group of doctors decided to test him. And they took a woman who introduced them, actually, to him. And they put her on the table, and they said, we're going to do something simple so that you can see how something simple works. And it's got to be exterior so you can see it happening. The doctors, and they were all plastic surgeons, hired a very good um, person to come in and videotape the entire thing. It's on tape. And they watched him change the shape of her face. And you hear the doctors on the tape saying, oh, my God, I don't believe this is happening. Right. Her whole nose is changing. Everything's, everything's moving. And all he does, he says he goes to source, and he goes back to creation, and he plays with the energies in the body and on the face, in her case, on her face. And he changes things. And he said anybody can do this, and this is what he intends to teach. So hopefully oh, uh, that school will be opening next year, and um, and that'll be a wonderful thing because um, the more people wake up to their own power and their own abilities, the better off this planet's going to be. True that. And, and and by the way, the planet is yeah. self-aware. Everybody out there, when you see Mom Earth being bombed or being, um, you know, just horrible things happen, she's feeling it. She is self-aware. That I'll go into you with you another time, but I, I'm sure and beyond a doubt that the planet is very self-aware. And, and Kate, can uh, mm-hmm. can can we take a quick five-minute break? Give you a, absolutely. Okay, give you a few minutes. Okay, great. And uh, and we'll be right back because uh, Chris, the host, he got locked off, but he's listening and he's got a couple questions that I'll relate. And, okay. And I have a question, no problem. So, okay. Wonderful. Thanks. All right. Okay. Great. Okay, we're back. Uh, Aunt Kate, are you still there? Okay, she'll be back yeah, in a she, minute. She is. I got her on mute. Hold on. Oh, okay, great. It, it, it's it's hard to uh, control this from uh, doing it from my phone and uh, doing all this other stuff. So. Yeah. Mm. Kind of a pain in the ass, but uh, yeah, we're back with our guest, and I'm here, guys. I'm here. I'm here. I'm back. <laughs> yeah, <welcome> back. <laughs> okay. I'm here. Good, good. Everybody's here now. Okay. Oh, yeah. What direction so. did you want to go? Oh, jeez. Chris, didn't you have a question? You had a couple questions. I mean, I got questions, but we were on a roll. You guys were on a roll. You guys are doing a great job. <laughs> Without me, that was great. 
<laughs> oh, this has been this has been there just is tremendous. so much, it's what, it's so much heard, that like, needs to be revealed. I got to yeah, tell you, is, yeah. Go, go the, ahead. the more that I learn, the less I know, hmm. because hmm. everything is becoming more and more complex as we go deeper down into those roots. And it's, no, it it's and going you know deeper was, down that rabbit hole. Jealous, jealous what? When, 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 every, when you guys are talking about a, a, a Sitchin, Zechariah yeah. Sitchin, because that's like, yeah, so I'm like, I'm, I'm sitting here like messaging Jeff, I'm like, oh man, yeah. <clears throat> I want to talk about this, but yeah, I mean, anyway, so. Sitchin understands something. Uh, one of my dear friends um, is was very close to Sitchin. I, I met Sitchin once at a lecture he gave uh, here in New Jersey. Oh my God. But one of my friends was very close to him. Traveled, you know, with him occasionally. Uh, attended lectures with him around the country. And this person oh. told me once that there was a lot Sitchin wanted to reveal, but he didn't dare because he had a deal. He knew a lot of people in the Council on Foreign Relations, and they knew things that he didn't know, and he was so desperate to have more information for himself that he traded information with them. He agreed not to say certain things so that they would give him information that he just needed to have for himself because his whole mm-hmm. life was wrapped around this. So it I really was. can't blame him. No, um, it, yeah. But this is why I question the whole Marduk thing, because in his book he said that Marduk w- died and um, and that he, he was killed or he died. And And then I read that the leaders of this world are meeting with Marduk, who is allegedly the king of the earth. And at right. one time, allegedly, he was. And so is he still? What's going on? Who's affecting things from down below? Is it simply Marduk? Is it, is it a group of entities? Is it the Archons? Is it the Anunnaki? Or is it something, as I was going through last night, something deeper? Is there something that goes further back? And these beings, these entities that have chosen to abuse the system are themselves incarnating into positions where they can enjoy the fruits of their very nasty labors. Um, And that's what it looks like. And certainly many of them are descendants of Anunnaki. Um, Actually, you know, we're all such a mix. Uh, We've all got a reptilian brain. Uh, We're all very much a mix of all of these beings and but as I said before, the idea of the um, the family, the one family descending from Jesus, is crazy because there are millions of families who descend from that bloodline, and, and um, there's nothing special about it. I mean, if you really go into the history, um, Joseph was not a poor carpenter; he was a very wealthy uh, descendant of David. Um, and he was the he and Mary were both of the Hebrew royal line, and they were not allowed to uh, the the Jews were not allowed to have a king at that point because the Romans were in charge, and the Romans said, "Here, you'll take this person as your king, even though he's not a Jew." And uh, Jesus was basically the Prince William of his time. And he would have been king. He or one of his brothers or one of his cousins would have been king if the if the Jews had been allowed to have a king of their own at that time. So um, this was not a poor family. This was a very wealthy family. Jesus traveled. It's believed he spent time in the East uh, picking up information there, which he infused into his teachings. And I think he was basically a nice Jewish boy. And um, very well off, very intelligent, who learned that we have abilities beyond what we have been taught we have, and who used them. But I, I don't believe he came here to save us from our sins. Uh, yeah, okay. So, 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 so. This is where we get into the whole <clears throat> religious aspect, where these religions have been used to control, um, to to cause wars, uh, and to basically um, make people unaware of their abilities. And that's where I, you know, I think that Jesus was a wonderful teacher. I think that what he said in the Bible 
however much of it is true, <laughs> you know, because these books have been changed so much over the years. Um, Lawrence Gardner. Lawrence Gardner was head of the Stewart family, and Jeff, you are a Stewart. You, you're 27 generations to Walter the Stewart, the head of the Stewart line. And uh, Lawrence Gardner um, talks a lot about, uh, in his books, in various books, he talks a lot about uh, the language changes over the millennia and what things, how things are interpreted today in religious circles aren't what was meant in the original writings. And uh, that, that can be very upsetting to Jews and Christians alike because it kind of negates some of the things, some of their claims. For instance, Mary, according to Lawrence Gardner, is referred to in the original Aramaic as a young woman. Um, the Jews had a very special word for virgin, and it's never used on Mary. And they talk constantly about Jesus being the son of, um, what's his face, his father, uh, Joseph, And Joseph had the most direct um, royal line. And so it would have made sense. Um, I believe Jesus very much was Joseph's son. And I believe that they may have been influenced by some alien influence and that Mary may have even been visited and have been affected in some way by an alien influence. Um, There are some who claim that Jesus was an Anunnaki, who was um, inserted down here by Anki because Anki felt that Anlil was bringing too much negativity to the earth, had brought too much negativity to the earth, and he wanted to bring something positive and, and loving to the earth. I don't know. You know, the more I learn, the less I know. I just right. store it away. And I have files and files and thousands of books, and I, I, am, I am a persistent and constant student. And, um, yes, probably 90% of what I hear I throw right out the window. (laughs) But there is a lot that's still unexplainable and still needs to be dealt with, and a lot that we're not allowed to deal with. They just don't want the powers that be, don't want things brought out. Of course. So we shall see what happens. I think we are in for interesting times ahead. I hope they are not... Painful times. Uh, have you all, in the last few days, seen what happened with the Georgia Guidestones? Oh, yeah. Yes. We talked okay. about it on last Thursday night show, yeah. Okay. Did you see the way the man took the stone down, the, the cornerstone, out of the Guidestones? There's a video of it. Did you see that video? Wow, no, I didn't we see didn't this. See oh, I know. Uh, okay, I'll forward that to you, Jeff. Okay. There is a, a um, there is a video, and boy, I'll tell you, I watched this and I said, oh my God, how ridiculous! First, you see a group of seven or eight people standing around about twenty feet from the guide stones, and they're glancing at the camera. Someone's videotaping it, but these are not people who are curious about the guide stones because if they were, they'd be all over those guide stones, looking at them with magnifying glasses and trying to figure out where the hell, who actually did these, um, who who got away with this. Uh, they'd be asking all kinds of questions. They'd be talking among themselves. Instead, they looked like they were waiting for something. And lo and behold, uh, a white, a long white pickup truck pulls up, and a middle-aged man with a paunch gets out of it. He's smiling. He looks very nice. And he carries a ladder and a box of tools over to the stones, And he puts the ladder against the stones, and he gets up with a chisel and a hammer, and he hammers out that cornerstone. And you could see 2014 on it before. And uh, he takes it down, he throws it down, and then he climbs down off the ladder. In the meantime, people are kind of looking at it, but he goes over, he takes it, he kneels down with his with one knee up and one knee down in a very uncomfortable position for what he's about to do. Um, but that was important. And then he proceeds to chisel all six sides off this rectangle, off the square. And you find out then that all six sides have something printed on them. One side has MM printed on it. One side has, I think, JMM. I'm not sure about that. But then there are other numbers 
on on this thing. And um, he chisels all of these off until uh, all the fine finish, all the polished finish is gone, and it's just a cube of very rough stone. In the meantime, all these people have grabbed the pieces. Um, I have a friend who's a mason who was very excited about that when I sent him the video, and he called me up and he said, do you realize what he was doing was a Masonic ritual? And I said, no, what do you mean? And he said, well, first of all, the way he was kneeling was the way an acolyte, when they're being initiated into the Masonic order, kneels. They have to have a specific knee up and a specific knee down. And he said it must have been uncomfortable for him because he was banging on that piece of stone. And he said also, in every Masonic hall, they have two stones. One is the square, and he didn't say to me whether there was anything on the square. I presume he can only say so much. But one is a polished square, the finished piece, and the other is a very rough square, the unfinished being, you know, kind of like you go from being unfinished to being finished. And he said, um, when he said what he was doing in taking that down, he said he was knocking off the date, he was knocking off all those numbers and taking it back to its rustic form. He said, I think they were saying that they failed. 2014 was probably when they intended to have everything done and they mm-hmm. didn't have it done and therefore they failed and they have to start over. They have to go back to the rustic shape sure. and start over. Now that's very logical, but I'm not sure. I am not sure what's going on because I also um, believe and have heard from a lot of good authorities over the years that there are several timelines paralleling each other and coming together at this time and basically there are three that are mostly talked about allegedly the other two are worse are in worse condition than ours uh i don't know if that's possible right wow. allegedly they are mm-hmm. and if they were coming together um chances are we would have to experience some more not so nice things as they come together until things smooth out now did that taking down of that stone have to do with the timelines coming together and things being different um i don't know about you but in the last couple of years and my masonic friend and i were talking about this together we have both seen people on tv who we thought had died four and five and ten years ago. And I'm sitting there saying, whoa, I have just jumped timelines. I am not my timeline anymore because that person wasn't there. And so there are a lot of strange things happen. You have to keep your eyes open, keep your ears open, uh, get things together to protect yourself because we live in an apparent physical universe, even though it isn't real. Um, And since we consider ourselves part of it, um, it's a good idea, unless you're an expert at, at controlling energies at this point, it's a good idea to protect yourself right now with things like nano silver, hydrogen peroxide, um, an ozone device, a Bob Beck machine, if you can still get one. The, the government kind of uh, went after them years ago. Um, but uh, there are a lot of things that need to be done in order to move forward. And the number one thing, the number one thing you can do before you go to bed when you get up in the morning is sit there, meditate yourself into a wonderful positive state where you see things beautifully, where you, you're, uh, Abraham describes it as floating downstream, not fighting the tide, and everything good coming towards you. And if enough people do that, we can turn things around. I'm convinced. Um, years ago, remember when the the, sh- the show X Files? Oh yeah. Anybody watch oh, yeah. X Files? <laughs> I was an X Files oh, yeah. junkie. I was an mm-hmm. X Files. What? <laughs> I, I didn't watch any of the X Files where they got into gory stuff because no, um, again, I. like I and Rand, I don't watch gore. I don't I don't watch anything that's not going to uplift my spirit or my mind. So if it's a horror story, if it's 
if it's disgusting, I don't watch it. I have nothing to do with it. And okay. uh, but but so uh, but I did watch the alien ones because I knew that they always reveal information, and I felt like there might be more information and more knowledge coming out of these. And so I did used to watch them. And when the last one was shown, which was supposed to tie up all the loose ends, I was furious because it didn't tie up anything. Um, and I that night I was meditating because I was kind of pissed off over the show. I had written a little article on it, which we had put up on our website. And I was meditating. And it was, you know, what's going on? Are these aliens taking over this world? Um, or is humanity going to still have control? And I got back a very serious meditation that said, many of the aliens that you are aware of come from places that they have destroyed simply by their, not, not by their choices, but by their um, emotions, their thoughts. Um, Earth is beautiful is beautiful because at their heart and at their soul, most people on this planet are beautiful. Mm. And if aliens come in and wipe out most of the population on this planet in order to make it their own because it is a beautiful planet, if they do that, the planet will turn as ugly as they and and so if they want to live on a beautiful planet, they better leave humanity here. You saw proof of that in 911. And by the way, that was when I got up. At, Ralph came in and said they just hit the World Trade Center. I jumped out of bed, came in and said, ha, huh, looks like a New World Order um, event. And I, I, we knew immediately that this was not 17 or so um, Arabs who <laughs> gladly took credit, but they had nothing to do with it. This was, you know, the cabal. I was, thing. I was in the room when, when that happened. Yeah, okay, was, yeah, and cool that's room. right, you were here. And um, we, and we knew immediately uh, what was going on. But they expected, from what I learned later, they expected the people in New York City to pack their bags and race out of the city or to sit there and scream, protect us, protect us, bring on martial law. And that's not what happened. Instead, you saw New Yorkers racing down to that 14th Street barrier and saying, what can I do to help? What can I do to make this better? Do you need soup? Do you need socks? Do you need a massage? Do you need fresh water? What can I do to help make things better? And that's what humans are. My son took economics courses at the county college um, years ago, and he came home with this book that was almost three inches thick, and there must have been 500 definitions in, the, in it on, from economics. And I skimmed through this book, went through the pages, looked at it, and I turned to him and I said, yeah. You have to memorize this crap in order to take your tests. But I'm going to tell you right now, there are only two words, two words, two definitions that you really need to know if you're in business, two things that you have to consider. They are supply and demand. That's it. Yep. That's it. And if you get them right, you'll have a successful business. And if you don't get them right, you won't. All the rest is crap. And this is what Rand was basically saying, and this is what libertarians are basically saying. And no, libertarians don't hate people, and they're not anti-charity. They just believe charity should be done individually by themselves, because if you give the government $100 for charity, they're going to keep 90 of it, and the, the people who need the money are only going to get 10 Um, We're living in very strange times. I'm not sure what direction they're going to go in. We're like at the edge of a cliff, and we could either pull back and go toward freedom, which would make things so much better for people, or we could go forward, fall over that cliff, and really see a mess with civilization. I do believe that because we live in this hologram and we're creating it with our thoughts and we've bought into a lot of the things we've read and seen, I do believe that we're going to see some cataclysms. 
I worry for the East Coast and I worry for the West Coast. Uh, after what I saw last night about symbolism, um, particularly uh, symbolic shapes of certain land p- masses, uh, I'm convinced that the West Coast is going to go and um, I wouldn't want to be living out there. Uh, on the other hand, I do believe that life is forever and that we come and go and we learn different things in each life. It's just a shame we can't take it with us because if you do a lot of studying, you know, you hate to leave and then have to come back and start all over again. <laughs> you know, that's a lot of work. Mm-hmm. But um, on the other hand, people do need to wake up and a lot of them need to study more. Um oh, yeah. I do think that the Anunnaki are affecting us and have been affecting us. I do think there are other alien groups that have been affecting us. Um, As you know, Jeff, I don't know that I should go into this. No, you can can go. And the government prevents that by sticking us in certain places. They've destroyed the school system. I mean, teachers can't teach anymore. They are limited as to what they can say in a classroom. I've spoken to so many teachers who say, you know, the truth of this history is this, and I'm not allowed to say that in the classroom. And kids are being badly, badly educated. This is why the homeschool kids are are going way past the public school kids every day because their parents are teaching them more. Uh, I I think if government got out of the way, this country would be much further ahead than it is. In fact, Ralph did a study on that back when he was in college because he did a lot of history in college uh, before he became a a libertarian lawyer. And uh, one of the things he studied was the educational system. And during the Industrial Revolution, they, the big industrialists, the big money people in this country, uh, Morgan, um, all those people said, geez, we, we can't, we'd love to build factories, but we can't get Americans to work in them. Over in Bismarck's Germany, people will stand on their feet 16 hours a day at a very low wage doing the same thing over and over and over, and they're perfectly happy. And over here, we can't hire people to do that. Well, a lot of the people who were very ambitious came to America for the freedom, and they weren't going to stand in one space all day. They took two and three jobs a day so that they could afford to bring over friends and relatives so they could build their own little restaurants and shops um, and, and produce things. They were ambitious. And there was no way they were going to work in that factory like that. So they realized that they had to somehow change the American psyche. They sent a group of people called the educationalists. They consisted of um, Dewey of the Dewey Decimal System, Harriet Beecher Stowe, and there were several others. And they were sent over for a year or two to Bismarck's Germany to study the system over there to see how do they get these people to work the way they do. Well, they came back and they said it's in one word, kindergarten. These kids are taught to stand in line. They're taught to raise their hand, wanting or twoing it. They're taught to be very obedient. They're taught not to be creative, and they're taught to think what they're told to think. And we kept the name kindergarten over here, and we formed the public school system. And, of course, as with every government program, they espoused it. They they lauded it as the most wonderful thing this is going to help when you kind of when you set up a massive road system you kind of become dependent on the car on the vehicle that's going to use it and and that's kind of sad you know you block creativity there i suspect by now we'd be zipping around in hovercrafts and parking them on our roofs there's no if question it for, that they, they've Yeah, they've if it weren't for the fact that we have this massive road system that we have to maintain. Right. Uh, it's the same thing. Um, you know, somebody once said, well, who would build roads in a libertarian um, system? And, you know, those people who need them would build them. The colonial people built roads, and they didn't have a central government saying, oh, we've got to put Route 280 here and Route 80 here, and we've got to do this, and my brother-in-law is going to build it for, you know, a, a lot of money. 
um, you didn't see that sort of stuff then. And But we've never really had a free market in this country. Every time something goes wrong, the government blames it on the free market that doesn't exist. We've been a socialist system for a very long time, and it hasn't done us very good, much good at all. And Kate, a um, question from a yeah. person I just got a message from. She says, he says, uh, ask her what she thinks about what society would be like if there was no scarcity, that we, that we have had flat scarcity imposed to control economics. Yeah, abs- I, I think it, we'd be post-scarcity by now. In that case, you'd see a situation where people would probably share the wealth. I think we were, we were getting closer and closer to post-scarcity, but scarcity is something that's controlled by government. It's kind of like Murray Rothbard, dear Murray Rothbard, the father of modern libertarianism, um, thrown out of Ayn Rand's inner circle because he wouldn't divorce his Presbyterian wife, uh, uh, Joanne, and a uh, dear man, very funny man, um, miss him terribly. And he, uh, you know, used to talk about the, how the government screws up the marketplace, okay? Totally screws up the marketplace. Th- there's no more need for buggy whips, but we can't let the buggy whip people not have a job anymore. Um, so we have to send tax money to the bubby, buggy whip uh, companies so they can continue producing something we have no need for just because we've got to keep those people uh, in in a job. And this isn't true. You know, the economy has to move where it has to move. And when you don't need buggy whips anymore, you have to move on to something else. You say, well, you know, I have a talent with leather. Maybe I ought to make purses. Maybe I'll, I'll go to work for Gucci or something like that. Um you have to move on. That's that's what it's all about. That's going forward. Everybody, this is going to educate everybody. And the fact is, it took education down. Before the public school system, people got educated. They got educated according to how they needed to be educated. Churches ran free schools. Neighborhoods got together and hired teachers. You saw, if you see any um, shows on the Old West, um, a town would hire a school marm to come in, and they'd share things, but it wasn't set up the way the public education system is today, where everything is uh, by rote, everything is controlled, everything is consistent, and now we have Michelle Obama telling the kids what they can and can't eat. Um, it was it was a freer system. It was, if the teacher had information on George Washington, um, they learned it, even if it was not necessarily nice. Um, cause, and I think of that because I was talking to someone last night about the alleged whiskey rebellion, which took place after the revolution when George Washington went after the those making whiskey to tax them. Here was a man who had just fought a revolution against taxes, and now he was taxing people. But the interesting thing is our school system has handed that bit of history down, not as the whiskey tax rebellion, but as the whiskey rebellion. Now, who rebels his right. whiskey, right? But this is the way they word things. This is the way things are, are set up. There's, there's so much hypocrisy and so much nonsense. Last week, one of the um, comedians on The Daily Show, got up and did a number on Ayn Rand. and I heard a tiny bit of it. It was supposed to be hysterical. Now, being a libertarian and being one of the 30 or 40 people who called themselves a libertarian back in the 60s and 70s, um, at a time when we thought, you know, the word libertarian wouldn't come into common usage for another 100 years, um, I knew a lot of people, not a lot, but I knew some people, some of my friends were taking classes at the Nathaniel Brandon Institute, which was an Ayn Rand um, uh, school. And so I went to some evening uh, uh, lectures with, with them on occasion. Uh, I did not consider myself an objectivist, a Randian objectivist, because while I did agree with her theories on the marketplace and on economics, she had very strict guidelines as to what a person should think and how they should feel and what they should like and dislike. She hated being referred to as a libertarian, and she constantly denied that. And she wasn't a libertarian. She had a very strict setup for what life should be and what it shouldn't be. Um, but um, listening to all this and, and watching all this, 
you know, you realize when you read Atlas Shrugged, you realize she was right about a lot of things. She was right about the marketplace. And people that say, oh, we have this corporate capitalism now and it's terrible. Well, Rand said the same thing. Yet you'll have these socialists who are criticizing this corporate capitalism that's going on where the government and the big corporations are acting as one. You have, you have them criticizing. They're also criticizing her. When, in fact, if you read Atlas Shrugged, the companies that remained independent until they got totally disgusted and went underground, just, to, you know, they, they, their owners abandoned them, um, they were the good guys, and they were the ones that were providing jobs and doing good work, and then there was the crony corporate capitalists who were working with government, and they were the ones who ultimately tore down and pulled down society. And people, you know, will criticize her when actually if they read her book, which most people don't, they'd realize she agreed with them. You know, she agreed with them that this crony capitalism is not good. And so I get a little annoyed because this this comedian got up last week and did a number on the selfishness of Ayn Rand. She espoused selfishness. She was quite blunt. She said that people operate in their own self-interest and for the most part they do you know you look for the best job you you try and find the best you can for your money you're operating in your own self-interest granted you help other people too you reach out and you i mean you know you if somebody needs help a friend needs help you help them as you can but generally speaking people have to operate in their own self-interest or they they die and what really irked me when I heard about this criticism of Rand was this comedian probably makes millions a year. He does all kinds of shows. Right. He does, and, and, and how much of his money is he giving away? He is operating selfishly in his own self-interest, and at the same time, he, he is living what Ayn Rand talked about, and he's making fun of her. Mm-hmm. Now, there are things about Rand I didn't like, you know. There, so like, hey, there. she was who she was. I'm who I am. I don't care. Live and let live. But these people these days, right now, there's a great deal of backlash against her because the movie Atlas Shrugged has come out in three parts. Um, I don't think they did a very good job with it because if you are an objectivist and you've read her books, you know where they're going. But if you're not an objectivist, you don't really get it. You know, you're not really learning about free markets by watching it. Uh, 